The letters which I now publish were sent to me recently by a person who knows me to be interested in ghost stories. There is no doubt about their authenticity. The paper on which they are written, the ink, and the whole external aspect put their date beyond the reach of question. The only point which they do not make clear is the identity of the writer. He signs with initials only, and as none of the envelopes of the letters are preserved, the surname of his correspondent, obviously a married brother, is as obscure as his own. No further preliminary explanation is needed, I think. Luckily, the first letter supplies all that could be expected. Letter 1 Great Crishel December 22nd, 1837 My dear Robert, it is with great regret for the enjoyment I am losing and for a reason which you will deplore equally with myself that I write to inform you that I am unable to join your circle for this Christmas. But you will agree with me that it is unavoidable when I say that I have within these few hours received a letter from Mrs. Hunt at Bister to the effect that our Uncle Henry has suddenly and mysteriously disappeared and begging me to go down there immediately and join the search that is being made for him. Little as I, or you either, I think, have ever seen of Uncle, I naturally feel that this is not a request that can be regarded lightly. And accordingly I propose to go to Bister by this afternoon's mail, reaching it late in the evening. I shall not go to the rectory, but put up at the King's Head, and to which you may address letters. I enclose a small draft which you will please make use of for the benefit of the young people. I shall write you daily supposing me to be detained more than a single day, then you may be sure, should the business be cleared up in time to permit of my coming to the manor after all, I shall present myself. I have but a few minutes at disposal. With cordial greetings to you all, and many regrets, believe me, your affectionate brother, W.R. Letter 2 King's Head December 23rd, 1837 My dear Robert, in the first place there is as yet no news of Uncle H, and I think you may finally dismiss any idea, I won't say, hope, that I might, after all, turn up for Christmas. However, my thoughts will be with you, and you have my best wishes for a really festive day. Mind that none of my nephews or nieces expend any fraction of their guineas on presents for me. Since I got here, I have been blaming myself for taking this affair of Uncle H. too easily. From what people here say, I gather that there is very little hope that he can still be alive. But whether it is accident or design that carried him off, I, I cannot judge. The facts are these. On Friday the 19th, he went, as usual, shortly before five o'clock, to read evening prayers at the church. And when they were over, Clark brought him a message, in response to which he set off to pay a visit to a sick person at an outlying cottage the better part of two miles away. He paid the visit, and started on his return journey at about half-past six. This is the last that is known of him. The people here are very much grieved at his loss. He had been here many years, as you know, and though, as you also know, he was not the most genial of men, and had more than a little of the martinet in his composition. He seems to have been active in good works, and unsparing of trouble to himself. Poor Mrs. Hunt, who has been his housekeeper ever since she left Woodley, is quite overcome. It seems like the end of the world to her. I am glad that I did not entertain the idea of taking quarters at the rectory, and I have declined several kindly offers of hospitality from people in the place, preferring, as I do, to be independent and finding myself very comfortable here. You will, of course, wish to know what has been done in the way of inquiry and search. First, nothing was to be expected from investigation at the rectory, and to be brief, nothing has transpired. I asked Mrs. Hunt, as others had done before, 
whether there was either any unfavourable symptom in her master such as might portend a sudden stroke or attack of illness, or whether he had ever had reason to apprehend any such thing. But both she and also his medical man were clear that this was not the case. He was quite in his usual health. In the second place, naturally, ponds and streams have been dragged, and fields in the neighbourhood which he is known to have visited last have been searched. Without result. I have myself talked to the parish clerk, and, more important, have been to the house where he paid his visit. There can be no question of any foul play on these people's part. The one man in the house is ill in bed and very weak. The wife and the children, of course, could do nothing themselves, nor is there the shadow of a probability that they or any of them should have agreed to decoy poor Uncle H out, in order that he might be attacked on the way back. They had told what they knew to several other inquirers already, but the woman repeated it to me. The rector was looking just as usual. He wasn't very long with the sick man. He ain't, she said, like someone has a gift in prayer. But there, if we was all that way, however would the chapel people get their living? He left some money when he went away, and one of the children saw him cross the stile into the next field. He was dressed, as he always was, wore his bands, I gather he is nearly the last man remaining who does so, at any rate in this district. You see, I am putting down everything. The fact is that I have nothing else to do, having brought no business papers with me, and moreover it serves to clear my own mind, and may suggest points which have been overlooked. So I shall continue to write all that passes, even to conversations if need be. You may read or not as you please, but... Pray keep the letters. I have another reason for writing so fully, but it is not a very tangible one. You may ask if I have myself made any search in the fields near the cottage. Something, a good deal, has been done by others, as I mentioned, but I hope to go over the ground tomorrow. Bow Street has now been informed, and will send down by tonight's coach, but I do not think they will make much of the job. There is no snow, which might have helped us. Fields are all grass. Of course, I was on the key vive for any indication today, both going and returning. But there was a thick mist on the way back, and I was not in trim for wandering about unknown pastures, especially on an evening when bushes looked like men, and a cow lowing in the distance might have been the last trump. I assure you, if Uncle Henry had stepped out from among the trees in a little copse, which borders the path at one place, carrying his head under his arm, I should have been very little more uncomfortable than I was. To tell you the truth, I was rather expecting something of the kind, but I must drop my pen for the moment. Mr. Lucas, the curate, is announced. Later, Mr. Lucas has been and gone, and there is not much beyond the decencies of ordinary sentiment to be got from him. I can see he has given up any idea that the rector can be alive, and that, so far as he can be, he is truly sorry. I can also discern that even in a more emotional person than Mr. Lucas, Uncle Henry was not likely to inspire strong attachment. Besides Mr. Lucas, I have had another visitor in the shape of my Boniface, mine host of the King's Head, who came to see whether I had everything I wished, and who really requires the pen of a boz to do him justice. He was very solemn and weighty at first. Well, sir, he said, I suppose we must bow our head beneath the blow, as my poor wife had used to say. So far as I can gather, there's been neither hide nor yet hair of our late respected incumbent scented out as yet. Not that he was what the scripture terms a hairy man in any sense of the word. I said, as well as I could, that I supposed not, but could not help adding that I had heard he was sometimes a little difficult to deal with. Mr. Bowman looked at me sharply for a moment and then passed in a flash from 
solemn sympathy to impassioned declamation. When I think, he said, of the language that man see fit to employ to me in this here parlour over no more matter than a cask of beer, such a thing as I told him might happen any day of the week to a man with a family, though as it turned out he was quite under a mistake, and that I knew at the time, only I was that shocked to hear him, I couldn't lay my tongue to the right expression. He stopped abruptly, and eyed me with some embarrassment. I only said, Dear me, I'm sorry to hear you had any little differences. I suppose my uncle will be a good deal missed in the parish. Mr. Bowman drew a long breath. Ah, yes, he said. Your uncle, you'll understand me when I say that for a moment it had slipped my remembrance that he was a relative, and, and natural enough, I must say, as it should, for as to you bearing any resemblance to, to him, the notion of any such a thing is clean ridiculous. And all the same, had I have bore it in my mind, you'll be among the first to feel, I'm sure, as I should have abstained my lips, or rather I should not have abstained my lips with no such reflections. I assured him that I quite understood, and was going to have asked him some further questions. But he was called away to see after some business. By the way, you need not take it into your head that he has anything to fear from the inquiry into poor Uncle Henry's disappearance, though no doubt in the watches of the night it will occur to him that I think he has, and I may expect explanations tomorrow. I must close this letter. It has to go by the late coach. Letter 3 December 25th, 1837 My dear Robert, This is a curious letter to be writing on Christmas Day, and yet, after all, there is nothing much in it. Or there may be, you shall be the judge. At least, nothing decisive. The Bow Street men practically say that they have no clue. The length of time and the weather conditions have made all tracks so faint as to be quite useless. Nothing that belonged to the dead man, I'm afraid no other word will do, has been picked up. As I expected, Mr. Bowman was uneasy in his mind this morning. Quite early I heard him holding forth in a very distinct voice, purposely so, I thought, to the Bow Street officers in the bar as to the loss that the town had sustained in their rector, and as to the necessity of leaving no stone unturned, he was very great on this phrase, in order to come at the truth. I suspect him of being an orator of repute at convivial meetings. When I was at breakfast, he came to wait on me, and took an opportunity when handing a muffin, to say in a low tone, I hope, sir, you recognise, as my feelings towards your relative is not actuated by any taint of what you may call malignity. You can leave the room, Eliza. I will see the gentleman as all he requires with my own hands. I ask your pardon, sir. But you must be well aware a man is not always master of himself. And when that man has been hurt in his mind by the application of expressions which I will go so far as to say had not ought to have been made use of, his voice was rising all this time and his face growing redder. No, sir, and here, if you will permit of it, I should like to explain to you in a very few words the exact state of the bone of contention. This cask, I, I might more truly call it a firkin of beer, I felt it was time to interpose and said that I did not see that it would help us very much to go into that matter in detail. Mr. Bowman acquiesced, and resumed more calmly. Well, sir, I bow to your ruling, and as you say, be that here or be it there, it don't contribute a great deal, perhaps, to the present question. All I wish you to understand is that I am as prepared as you are yourself to lend every hand to the business we have afore us, and as I took the opportunity to say as much to the officers not three quarters of an hour ago, to leave no stone unturned as may throw even a spark of light on this painful matter. In fact, Mr. Bowman did accompany us on our exploration. But though I am sure his genuine wish was to be helpful, I am afraid he did not contribute to the serious side of it. 
He appeared to be under the impression that we were likely to meet either Uncle Henry or the person responsible for his disappearance walking about the fields, and did a great deal of shading his eyes with his hand and calling our attention by pointing with his stick to distant cattle and labourers. He held several long conversations with old women whom we met, and was very strict and severe in his manner, but on each occasion returned to our party, saying, Well, I find she don't seem to have no connection with this sad affair. I think you may take it from me, sir, as there's little or no light to be looked for from that quarter, not without she's keeping something back intentional. We gained no appreciable result, as I told you at starting. The Bow Street men have left the town, whether for London or not, I'm not sure. This evening I had company in the shape of a bagman, a smartish fellow. He knew what was going forward, but though he has been on the roads for some days about here, he had nothing to tell of suspicious characters, tramps, wandering sailors, or gypsies. He was very full of a capital Punch and Judy show he had seen this same day at Whitley, and asked if it had been here yet, and advised me by no means to miss it if it does come. The best Punch and the best Toby Dog, he said, he had ever come across. Toby dogs, you know, are the last new thing in the shows. I have only seen one myself, but before long all the men will have them. Now why, you will want to know, do I trouble to write all this to you? I am obliged to do it, because it has something to do with another absurd trifle, as you will inevitably say, which in my present state of rather unquiet fancy, nothing more, perhaps, I have put down. It is a dream, sir, which I am going to record, and I must say it is one of the oddest I have had. Is there anything in it, beyond what the bagman's talk and Uncle Henry's disappearance could have suggested? You, I repeat, shall judge. I am not in a sufficiently cool and judicial frame to do so. It began with what I can only describe as a pulling aside of curtains and I found myself seated in a place. I don't know whether indoors or out. There were people, and only a few, on either side of me, but I did not recognise them, or indeed think much about them. They never spoke, but so far as I remember, were all grave and pale-faced and looked fixedly before them. Facing me, there was a Punch and Judy show, perhaps rather larger than the ordinary ones painted with black figures on a reddish-yellow ground. Behind it, and on each side, was only darkness, but in front there was a sufficiency of light. I was strung up to a high degree of expectation, and looked every moment to hear the panpipes and the rooty to it. Instead of that, there came suddenly an enormous, I can use no other word, an enormous single toll of a bell. I don't know from how far off. Somewhere behind, the little curtain flew up, and the drama began. I believe someone once tried to rewrite Punch as a serious tragedy, but whoever he may have been, this performance would have suited him exactly. There was something satanic about the hero. He varied his methods of attack. For some of his victims he lay in wait, and to see his horrible face, it was yellowish-white, I may remark, peering round the wings, made me think of the vampire in Fuseli's foul sketch. To others he was polite and carnying, and particularly to the unfortunate alien, who can only say Shalabala, though what Punch said I could never catch, and with all of them I came to dread the moment of death, crack of the stick on their skulls which in the ordinary way delights me, had here a crushing sound, as if the bone was giving way, and the victims quivered and kicked as they lay. The baby, it sounds more ridiculous as I go on, the baby, I am sure, was alive. Punch wrung its neck and if the choke or squeak which it gave were not real. 
I know nothing of reality. The stage got perceptibly darker as each crime was consummated, and at last there was one murder which was done quite in the dark, so that I could see nothing of the victim, and took some time to effect. It was accompanied by hard breathing and horrid muffled sounds, and after it Punch came and sat on the footboard, and fanned himself, and looked at his shoes which were bloody and hung his head on one side and sniggered in so deadly a fashion that I saw some of those beside me cover their faces and I would gladly have done the same. But in the meantime the scene behind Punch was clearing and showed not the usual house front but something more ambitious a grove of trees and the gentle slope of a hill with a very natural, in fact I should say a real, moon shining on it. Over this there rose slowly an object which I soon perceived to be a human figure, with something peculiar about the head. What I was unable at first to see. It did not stand on its feet, but began creeping or dragging itself across the middle distance towards Punch, who still sat back to it. And by this time I may remark, though it did not occur to me at the moment, that all pretense of this being a puppet show had vanished. Punch was still Punch, it is true, but, like the others, was in some sense a live creature, and both moved themselves at their own will. When I next glanced at him, he was sitting in malignant reflection, but in another instant something seemed to attract his attention and he first sat up sharply, and then turned round, and evidently caught sight of the person that was approaching him, and was in fact now very near. Then indeed did he show unmistakable signs of terror. Catching up his stick, he rushed towards the wood, only just eluding the arm of his pursuer, which was suddenly flung out to intercept him. It was with a revulsion which I cannot easily express, that I now saw more or less clearly what this pursuer was like. He was a sturdy figure, clad in black, and, as I thought, wearing bands. His head was covered with a whitish bag. The chase, which now began, lasted I do not know how long. Now among the trees, now along the slope of the field, sometimes both figures disappearing wholly for a few seconds and only some uncertain sounds letting one know that they were still afoot. At length there came a moment when Punch, evidently exhausted, staggered in from the left, and threw himself down among the trees. His pursuer was not long after him, and came looking uncertainly from side to side, then catching sight of the figure on the ground. He too threw himself down. His back was turned to the audience, with a swift motion, twitched the covering from his head, and thrust his face into that of Punch. And everything on the instant grew dark. There was one long, loud, shuddering scream, and I awoke to find myself looking straight into the face of, what in all the world do you think, but a large owl, which was seated on my window sill immediately opposite my bedfoot, holding up its wings like two shrouded arms. I caught the fierce glance of its yellow eyes. Then it was gone. I heard the single enormous bell again, very likely as you are saying to yourself the church clock. But I do not think so. And then I was broad awake. All this, I may say, happened within the last half hour. There was no probability of my getting to sleep again. So I got up, put on clothes enough to keep me warm, and am writing this rigmarole in the first hours of Christmas Day. Have I left out anything? Yes. There was no Toby Dog, and the names over the front of the Punch and Judy booth were Kidman and Gallop which was certainly not what the bagman told me to look out for. 
By this time I feel a little more as if I should sleep, so this shall be sealed and wafered. Letter 4 December 26th, 1837 My dear Robert, all is over. The body has been found. I do not make excuses for not having sent off my news by last night's mail, for the simple reason that I was incapable of putting pen to paper. The events that attended the discovery bewildered me so completely that I needed what I could get of a night's rest to enable me to face the situation at all. Now I can give you my journal of the day, certainly the strangest Christmas day that ever I spent, or am likely to spend. The first incident was not very serious. Mr. Bowman had, I think, been keeping Christmas Eve, and was a little inclined to be captious. At least he was not on foot very early, and to judge from what I could hear, neither men nor maids could do anything to please him. The latter were certainly reduced to tears, nor am I sure that Mr. Bowman succeeded in preserving a manly composure. At any rate, when I came downstairs, it was in a broken voice that he wished me the compliments of the season, and a little later on, when he paid his visit of ceremony at breakfast, he was far from cheerful, even Byronic, I might almost say, in his outlook on life. I don't know, he said, if you think with me, sir, but every Christmas as comes round the world seems all or a thing to me. Why? Take an example now from what lays under my own eye. There's my servant, Eliza, been with me now for going on fifteen years. I thought I could have placed my confidence in Eliza. And yet, this very morning, Christmas morning too, of all the blessed days in the year, with the bells are ringing and, and all like that, I say, this very morning, had it not been for Providence watching over us all, that girl would have put... Indeed, I may go so far to say, add put, the cheese on your breakfast table. He saw I was about to speak, and waved his hand at me. Well, it's all very well for you to say, yes, Mr. Bowman, but you took away the cheese and locked it up in the cupboard, which I did, and have the key here, or if not the actual key, one very much about the same size. That's true enough, sir. What do you think is the effect of that action on me? Why... That's no exaggeration for me to say that the ground is cut from under my feet. And yet, when I said as much to Eliza, not, not nasty, mind you, but just firm-like, what was my return? Oh, she says, well, she says, there wasn't no bones broke, I suppose. Well, sir, it hurt me. That's all I can say. It hurt me, and I don't like to think of it now. There was an ominous pause here, in which I ventured to say something like, Yes, very trying, and then asked at what hour the church service was to be. <sighs> Eleven o'clock, Mr. Bowman said, with a heavy sigh. Ah, you won't have no such discourse from poor Mr. Lucas as what you would have done from our late rector. Him and May may have had our little differences, and did do, more's the pay. I could see that a powerful effort was needed to keep him off the vexed question of the cask of beer. But he made it. I will say this, that a better preacher, nor yet one to stand faster by his rights or what he considered to be his rights, however, that's not the question now, I for one never set under. Some might say, was he an eloquent man? And of that my answer would be, well, there, you've a better right, perhaps, to speak of your own uncle than what I have. Others might ask, did he keep hold of his congregation? And there again I should reply, that depends. But as I say, yes, Eliza, my girl, I'm coming. Eleven o'clock, sir, and you inquire for the King's Ed pew. I believe Eliza had been very near the door, and shall consider it in my veil. The next episode was church. I felt Mr. Lucas had a difficult task in doing justice to Christmas sentiments, and also to the feeling of disquiet and regret which, whatever Mr. Bowman might say, was clearly prevalent. I do not think he rose to the occasion. 
and I was uncomfortable. The organ moved, you know what I mean, the wind died, twice in the Christmas hymn, and the tenor bell, I suppose owing to some negligence on the part of the ringers, kept sounding faintly about once in a minute during the sermon. The clerk sent up a man to see it, but he seemed unable to do much. I was glad when it was over. There was an odd incident, too, before the service. I went in rather early, and came upon two men carrying the parish beer back to its place under the tower. From what I overheard them saying, it appeared that it had been put out by mistake, by someone who was not there. I also saw the clerk busy folding up a moth-eaten velvet pall. Not a sight for Christmas Day. I dined soon after this, and then, feeling disinclined to go out, took my seat by the fire in the parlour, with the last number of Pickwick, which I had been saving up for some days. I thought I could be sure of keeping awake over this. But I turned out as bad as our friend Smith. I suppose it was half past two when I was roused by a piercing whistle, and laughing and talking voices outside in the marketplace. It was a Punch and Judy. I had no doubt the one that my bagman had seen at Whitley. I was half delighted, half not. The latter because my unpleasant dream came back to me so vividly. But anyhow, I determined to see it through, and I sent Eliza out with a crown piece to the performers, and a request that they would face my window if they could manage it. The show was a very smart new one. The names of the proprietors, I need hardly tell you, were Italian, Forresta and Calpigi. The Toby Dog was there, as I had been led to expect. All Bista turned out, but did not obstruct my view, for I was at the large first-floor window, and not ten yards away. The play began on the stroke of a quarter to three by the church clock. Certainly it was very good and I was soon relieved to find that the disgust my dream had given me for Punch's onslaughts on his ill-starred visitors was only transient. I laughed at the demise of the turncock, the foreigner, the beadle, and even the baby. The only drawback was the Toby Dog's developing a tendency to howl in the wrong place. Something had occurred, I suppose, to upset him. Something considerable for... I forget exactly at what point he gave a most lamentable cry, leapt off the footboard and shot away across the marketplace and down a side street. There was a stage wait, but only a brief one. I suppose the men decided that it was no good going after him, and that he was likely to turn up again at night. We went on. Punch dealt faithfully with Judy, and in fact with all comers, and then came the moment when the gallows was erected, and the great scene with Mr. Ketch was to be enacted. It was now that something happened, of which I can certainly not yet see the import fully. You have witnessed an execution, and know what the criminal's head looks like with the cap on. If you were like me, you never wish to think of it again, and I do not willingly remind you of it. It was just such a head as that that I, from my somewhat higher post, saw in the inside of the showbox. But at first the audience did not see it. I expected it to emerge into their view, but instead of that there slowly rose for a few seconds an uncovered face, with an expression of terror upon it, of which I have never imagined the like. It seemed as if the man, whoever he was, being forcibly lifted, with his arms somehow pinioned or held back towards the little gibbet on the stage. I could just see the night-capped head behind him. Then there was a cry and a crash. The whole showbox fell over backwards. Kicking legs were seen among the ruins. And then two figures, as some said, I can only answer for one, were visible running at top speed across the square and disappearing in a lane which leads to the fields. Of course, everybody gave chase. I followed, but the pace was killing, and very few were in, literally, at the death. It 
happened in a chalk pit. The man went over the edge quite blindly and broke his neck, searched everywhere for the other, until it occurred to me to ask whether he had ever left the marketplace. At first everyone was sure that he had, but when we came to look he was there, under the show box, dead too. But in the chalk pit it was that poor Uncle Henry's body was found, with a sack over the head, the throat horribly mangled. It was a peaked corner of the sack, sticking out of the soil that attracted attention. I cannot bring myself to write in greater detail. I forgot to say, the men's real names were Kidman and Gallop. I feel sure I have heard them, but no one here seems to know anything about them. I am coming to you as soon as I can after the funeral. I must tell you when we meet what I think of it all. Today's story was The Story of a Disappearance and an Appearance by M. R. James. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. If you enjoy the show, why not become a patron on Patreon and gain access to exclusive content? It's the surest way to help me keep creating. You can also buy me a coffee, like, subscribe, comment, share, follow on social media, and read the description for more information about the show and how you can engage with it. Until next time, sweet dreams.